Hi. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. How are you both? We're doing well. We're delighted to be with you. Hey, thank you so much for having us. Great. Thank you. So can you share a little bit about um, how you got to where you are today and a little bit about your stories and um, a little bit about the book that you've just had out? Sure, absolutely. I guess we'll, should we start with our story sure. and then go into the book? Um, so um, the two of us met in college and um, I think uh, now you would call us um, highly sensitive young women, <laughs> um, very empathic. And I think we just, we recognized in each other um, an emotional connection and avail availability. And, you know, we both we both struggled with sort of big emotions, right? And and um, when we graduated and hit our 20s and started our adult lives, we both really started to struggle with anxiety. And at, and at different times, um, each of us found ourselves completely debilitated by our anxiety to the point where it became hard to live our lives and even sometimes leave the house. Um, and so we wanted to feel better. Like we didn't necessarily even understand what was wrong. We just knew I, I can't live like this. Like I, I can't live feeling terrible all the time. And so we had this decade of what we called the IS, where we went to the nutritionist, the acupuncturist, the cardiologist, the Hypnotist. psychiatrist, <laughs> past life regressionist, like anyone who offered a glimmer of hope and would take our money, we were there. Um, and the thing that we realized kind of after quite a while of doing this was that what really helped us the most was having this incredibly supportive friendship where someone, you know, was always there to reach out to and um, had so much compassion or even some days challenged us a little to, to get out and do things, right? So we it was really our friendship with each other that was the most healing piece, even though all those other things, some of them were helpful too. Um, and so we, um, as we sort of progressed a little bit, we, Abby became a professor of communications and I got a master's in social work and became a school counselor. And we found that we were able to use our work as researchers and counselors and educators to translate some of the science of the brain and anxiety into actual practical um, ways to help us, right? So some of that, some of those like research and literature, we could, we could now read it and figure out how to use it in our lives. And um, so then we had this face, fateful like bus adventure and I, I will let Abby tell that story she's better than me at it so oh the bus ride yeah we were on our way from New Jersey to Manhattan and we were talking too loudly about the side effects of our anti-anxiety medication because we're after all the anxiety sisters so we talk inappropriately loudly about such things and the woman in the seat in front of us turned around and said oh I'm on that same medicine and I have that same side effect what do you do about it and within 20 minutes most of the women on the bus were engaged in this conversation with us. When we got off the bus, I said to Mags, can you believe how eager and willing these women were to talk about such intimate things with perfect strangers? And she said, yes, because anxiety is so isolating and it is so lonely and people crave community. They crave, they crave company in the struggle. What we had. Yeah, what, they, crave. they crave what we had. And then she sort of announced on the street in Manhattan, we're anxiety sisters. And it stuck. Mm. Brilliant. Yeah. I love that. And I love how, you know, you talk about how important having friendship and support and that sisterhood is, because I think a lot of the messages that we're sent about sort of recovering from mental health are that we need to sort of do this on our own. And it's like, it's kind of like your fault if you feel yeah. bad and you're just not trying hard enough. And you know, you got yourself into this mess, you need to get yourself out and that sort of thing. And I think it's really not the case. We, we need each other, don't we? We really need each other. And our culture does a lot of blaming and shaming when, we, when it comes to mental health issues, right? 
So people who suffer from anxiety and depression and any other brain disorder, we really, we're already beating ourselves up because we're already upset that we can't do the things we want to do all the time. And now there's also the societal message messages that are coming through that, you know, well, you're just not trying hard enough, or why can't you get yourself together, or just calm down. And it's very shaming. And, and we found that being in a community has really helped to, to bring that down, because, you know, we feel you can live happily with anxiety. You just can't live happily with blame and shame. That's the part that's, that's really the rub. Yeah. And human beings are meant to be connectors. It's like, there, there's that famous um, Harry Harlow saying, you know, a lone monkey is a dead monkey. That's the same thing for us. We are meant to connect with each other. Um, and there's so much research backing up that even small connections throughout the day, saying hi to the guy that sells you coffee, you walk out of that coffee shop in a better mood than if you didn't have that chit chat. Like really small things throughout the day also make a big difference because we are, we're, we're sort of a, we're tribal people, right. you know, we were meant to, to connect. Yeah. I mean, we have very specifically designed neurons called mir mirror neurons that are just meant to read other people and respond to them. So for instance, if I smile at you really big, you're going to start smiling back at me without even meaning to, right? Here it goes. <laughs> you're smiling at me now. It's that's true. Our yeah, that's our mirror neurons are in action there. We are designed for it. So we tell people, and it doesn't have to be intimate, right? It doesn't have to be a close family member or friend that you're connecting with. You can do it online. You can come hang out on our Facebook page and be uplifted by all the warm, generous, kind people that are supporting each other there that none of us have ever met. It's still a connection. We still have a chance to engage, and that is so important to healing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, can you can you share a bit more about the book then? So the Anxiety Sisters Survival Guide, how did that come about? And what's the what's the premise of the book for people that haven't read it yet? OK, so um, that book, is we wrote the book that we needed desperately when we were really struggling with anxiety, when it was at its worst. We needed that book. We looked for that book and we couldn't find it. Um, we would call it a field guide to anxiety. Right. Everything you ever wanted to know about anxiety and then some, but, but might have been too anxious to ask, which it's a very comprehensive. It's a science and research based book, although it's very conversational. We try to use some humor and we 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 translate the scientific jargon into more manageable and we think more metaphoric jargon, such as, for instance, for panic, we use the word spinning. Because when our brains hear the word panic, they think it's a command. So we like the word spinning because it's sort of descriptive of the activity and a little less threatening. And, and so that's, that's what the book is about. And we, we find that it, um, well, I think what's special about the book or what makes it different from other mental health books is that um, despite the fact that we have backgrounds in counseling and education and research, it, it's, we're really coming at this book from the sufferer's perspective. We write this book from two women who have lived with anxiety their entire lives and who have learned to manage it and to live well. So that's the perspective. There's, there's a lot of hopefulness in that perspective, mm. we feel, because we can say to people, look, we've been there. We've walked the walk. I mean, we've not only walked the walk, we've huddled, we've heaved, we've hurled, we've sweated, we've palpitated, we've done all of that. We get it. We know how hard it is. And there is hopefulness that you can feel more happy and connected even if your anxiety doesn't go completely away, because for some people, it's not something you can eliminate. It's a brain disorder that's part of your life. It's true for us, but it's a condition like anything else. You can manage it and and live really well. I think the I think the thing about the book for me too is that there's a lot of practical tips in the book as well that you can use whether you are at the point where you barely can leave your house or can't leave your house or whether you're pretty much out and about but just dealing with a lot of anxiety. So there's there's a lot of practical tips and because we end up both before pandemic, pre-pandemic, we used to do a lot of workshops and retreats. Um, and and now and we we have this enormous community right, on a normous of 200,000 or so anxiety sisters on social media. So we end up hearing stories every day, like the stories of what it really feels like or what really helped or what really didn't help. And so the book reflects 
and has a lot of those stories, like little vignettes in it. Yeah, so we're hoping people can recognize a little of their own struggles, since we all, even though we're all unique people, our struggles with anxiety sometimes aren't so new, so unique. And, and that's something that's really important to us, is that people know they're not alone, and that there's other people out there sharing the same exact challenges, and that there's ways to manage it. And, you know, when we sort of feel like anxiety is, is so awful that you, you don't just need a bag of tricks, you need like a whole arsenal of techniques, because one size doesn't fit all right? What works for you on one day might not work for you on the next day. And what works for you might not work for me. So we really try to have backup after backup after backup plan for people so that they can try stuff on and see what fits. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the thing about knowing that you're not alone is so important. And I liked what you said about how I think there's a balance between believing that we can do something about our anxiety and believing there are things we can do and also not putting so much pressure on ourselves that we have to cure ourselves or be, per- it's almost like perfectionism can come in. Like I need to get rid of all, ang- if I haven't got rid of all anxiety, if I have one setback, then I fail, then I'm, you know, and I like that you're talking about having that sort of balance between acceptance and also knowing that there's things that, that we can do about it. And I, I was wondering, you know, you mentioned about, you know, the friendship being, you know, important for your your sort of recovery what were the other things that really helped you both you know did you have therapy are you you know meditation are there kind of one or two things that you can share that really helped helped you both I I would say between the two of us um, everything we we we, we, there were years where we were just doing everything which which is also you know in a sense sometimes too much but um we were definitely there because we were so desperate um but what what we I think both see is that there's there's short term things that that one can do and there's things we can do like when we're in crisis right you have like tips and tricks and then there's longer term things you can do um or we can do to help our our health in general and our mental health in particular so we both went the therapy route which is great great and helpful and helpful um medication medication great great and and helpful Um, we both u- utilized a lot of sort of um, ways to manage panic um, at the moment, right? So that was like talking to ourselves and breathing techniques, breathing tech, uh, you know, for Abby, it was breathing techniques. For me, it was and for me, it was um, figuring out some other things to do. Mantras, and mantras were big. were big for me. Um, and then we both have taken a lot of steps like meditation for Abby is really, really important. Um, yeah, the mindfulness piece it's been, in terms of for the long term management of, of my anxiety disorder, I would say walking in nature on a daily basis and meditating are the two most important things I do for myself. But neither of those things were possible for me when I was first going through panic disorder and literally having these horrendous events three or four times a day that left me unable to move, just curled up in a fetal position, panicked and, and sweating and, and, and crying. So, so if someone back then had said to me, you know, oh, you need to get out in nature every day, it's going to really help you. I, it, I wouldn't have been able to. So I, that's, that's what yeah. Maggie means. By there's stuff you do in the immediate, mm. if you're dealing with acute anxiety, and those might include breathing techniques and self-talk and self-compassion, all kinds of things like that. Um, carrying a spin kit, which we advocate, which is basically a first aid kit for anxiety. Um, you know, there's lots of stuff you can do. And then as you manage your anxiety and as you kind of get a hold of it and you become more in the driver's seat, then you can do some really important lifestyle changes that can really benefit you like moving your body any way that you can and doing some mindfulness on any level whether it be meditation or visualization or just being absorbed in a great book or listening to great music yeah there's definitely a distinction isn't there between what's going to work as I think about the things that are kind of maintenance for me that I'm just doing every day to keep anxiety at bay and then there are different techniques so if it really ramps up or if I'm, I haven't had a panic attack in, a, in quite a long time, but there would definitely be different techniques for those moments. And right. um, if someone, yeah, if someone just is a catastrophizer and they're constantly thinking the worst case scenario, there's a way of sort of examining your thoughts and talking to yourself that is very useful at the moment, you know, because perhaps meditation might not be the thing that's useful at that moment. It's mm-hmm. hard if your thoughts are racing to then 
be still with your thoughts. I mean, that's not helpful. It's been very uncontrolled, I would say. So, yeah, we we understand, you know. But our basic take is that we are pro anything that helps as long as it doesn't hurt another person. Yes. Yeah. 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 And we are all different. And sometimes things will work. And I've definitely gone down the route of seeing all manner of alternative practitioners and some things have worked really well and some things not so much. And obviously it's not ideal if you're wasting money, but you know, it's it's worth trying things, especially if it's something that's free or low cost, like getting a book or, you know, something Mm -hmm. like that. Um, Well, I have to tell you, I I tried hypnotherapy and it worked really well for me. That was a really useful alternative technique. And also acupuncture was really helpful for me and Reiki. So in other words, a lot of stuff that some people think is very woo out there has been very helpful yeah. so right. we don't say we don't say poo poo to anything yeah. <laughs> because you know yeah yeah definitely um i notice on your website there's a big red button on there yeah. <laughs> you can't miss it <laughs> the panic button can you tell us about that and you know if someone is having a panic attack you know what can they do in those moments Well, the panic button is a great idea. It's on our website at anxietysisters.com. And you you press the panic button and it's Abby's voice kind of talking you through in a a very calming way. And um, we get about, what is it, 1,700 1700 presses presses a week. A week on that. We don't know who presses. We just see how many times it's pressed. Yeah. And, And people have given us incredible feedback about how helpful that's been. Um, I always like to say my own son um, uses it because, you know, he finds Auntie Abby's voice and that whole thing much more calming than coming to me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, people of all ages have told us that that, that is something really powerful when yeah. they're in the throes of high anxiety. Yeah, we heard last week from a senior in high school who's having a lot of anxiety, and she says that she presses that panic button every day on the way to school. So. Brilliant. Brilliant. It's just, it's almost a meditative, you know, I'm right here with you. We're going to get through this together. It's sort of that you're not alone. Mm-hmm. I've been through it and I promise you, you're going to get through this too. And I'm here with you and, you know, it, it's helpful. Yeah. Cause we, we in those moments, especially if you're, you're just starting to have panic attacks, like you've never had a panic attack before, or you don't know much about anxiety. It can really feel as though, you're going to lose control. You're going to, you're having a meltdown. You're going to go crazy. You're going to have to, you're going to end up in hospital. It's mm-hmm. really very frightening. And, and just, yeah, imagine having something in those moments to, to calm yourself and get that reassurance is really, really helpful. You mentioned a moment ago, the spin kit. And I'm really <laughs> curious what, what is in the spin kit? Can you share what that is? Is it literally like something that people will, like physical items no, that you, people carry have, around like, or? You know how, like, if you have an allergy, you would carry an EpiPen? So the same is true. If you have anxiety, you would carry a spin kit, which is our sort of name for a portable first aid kit for anxiety. And it's just, you know, a bag, a box, whatever you want to throw together, and everyone's will be slightly different. But, like, what are the kinds of things we have in there? So we generally think of, with anxiety, it's great to have something, you know how your senses become really heightened? It's great to have some stuff that will soothe your senses that might be... For me, that's always lavender, like the lavender spray or lotion. Um, For someone else, that might be a strong mint. That's also really sort of good if you're having that floaty feeling to bring you down. Um, Then we'll have something to deal with um, just distraction, just to help distract you, not to stop the panic attack, because we really don't, we really say you can't really stop the attack, but you can distract yourself. So Abby always has like, her her pictures fidget. of her or fidget spinner or fidget your spinner. picture of your pets and I often have a little crochet project with me something to do with my hands and then we always say it's nice to have some symptom relief you know my stomach goes crazy when I'm very anxious so I have some stomach medicine someone else may have a sedative a sedative Tylenol if you get a bad headache yeah whatever whatever your sim- um, ginger tea you know little tea bag whatever your symptoms are having something to soothe them. And that basically, it, it's the idea of being prepared for the anxiety. We, we believe in prepping for panic. And when we are prepared, we don't have that shock value. You know how it, you're standing in the supermarket and you get a, an attack and it's shocking. It's like, what, what, 
I'm not doing anything scary right now. Mm. But if you have your spin kit with you, you're prepared for it. So even that alone, knowing you have it with you, it, that alone kind of eases the whole idea of the whole. Yeah, there can't surprise. be a sneak attack yeah. because you're ready for it. You have your spin kit. And people don't realize this, but most of the intensity of a panic attack comes from that loop of feeling a symptom, trying to figure out why the heck you're feeling that symptom, and then it intensifies because what we pay attention to grows, right? But if you've got your spin kit with you, you're like, all right, I'm having symptoms, but I have stuff in here to deal with this. So you don't go into that loop of why, because yeah, whatever, why I have this kit here, it doesn't matter, I have something to help me. And that takes away the intensity of it so much because you didn't get, you weren't surprised by it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I often, I have a kind of roller ball of essential oils. I have, I've got one in every bag, so I've always got one with me. And it's something you have a spin kit. really yeah. grounding. I've got my spin kit. I've got my spin yeah. kit. <laughs> Just something so grounding that brings you back into the body. Because when we're in an anxious state, whether we're overthinking, we're kind of all up in our heads. Or, you know, when you're highly anxious, you can feel almost like a bit um, dissociated or a lot dissociated. Yes. Oh, Just yes. bringing you Lord. back into the body, connecting you to a smell um, or, you know, doing something physically with your hand, like the knitting or, you know, the yeah. something to fidget with. Yeah, just sort of bringing you back to your body and back to the moment and distracting you. Such a good idea, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. We don't go anywhere without ours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. Can, can you talk about um, riding the wave of anxiety and what you mean by that? I know you've got a three-step approach to to riding the wave of anxiety. Um, can you share anything about that? Do, uh, you know, I guess we should just tell you why we call it riding the wave. Because um, for, for those folks who don't live near an ocean, um, you probably not, haven't experienced a rip current. But uh, I grew up in Florida, so I have definitely experienced a riptide. And what a riptide is, it's this sort of rogue tug of, of, of current underneath that pulls you away from shore. And no matter what you do, it keeps pulling you away from shore. And your gut instinct is to try to swim against that and fight against it and try to get to shore. The problem is that no amount of strength is going to get you to shore if you're being caught in a riptide. Even Michael Phelps couldn't break out of a riptide and get to shore. So we liken that experience to anxiety. When you're in the throes of some kind of severe anxiety, no matter what you do, if you fight it, it will not let you go. So we really believe in not fighting your anxiety, but in riding the wave of it until it will release you. Just like in a riptide, you just go with the riptide and eventually it subsides and you can go back to shore. And the same is true for anxiety. It doesn't feel like it will pass, but like every human emotion and sensation, the anxiety will go away. And now we're not just saying, all right, just hang out there and suffer. We you know that, that would be mean. We, we do have lots of things to do while you're riding the wave, but the idea is to not fight it. And that's, and that's what riding the wave is all about. And we have a three-step approach to riding the wave. So the first step is expecting. The second step is accepting. And the third is being kind. So expect would mean, like we've been talking about planning for panic or carrying a spin kit, right? Just expecting that, oh, I'm an anxiety sister, so it's very possible that I'm going to wake up tomorrow with anxiety. That's just part of who I am. And that expectation takes away the surprise attack that we were talking about. And then the acceptance piece, once you've, ex once you've expected the anxiety to be there, then what you're really saying is, I accept that anxiety is part of my life. And once you accept that, ironically, it becomes less a part of your life because we don't realize how much the struggle against the anxiety triggers the fight or flight itself. And as we start to back away from that fight and just sort of say, all right, you know, this is what it is. I'm an anxiety person and I'm going to have to manage my life with this in the same way somebody does with tendinitis or diabetes or any other condition that you have to manage. Um, then it definitely loosens its power. And then finally, be kind is our codes for, for self-compassion, which has been life-changing for both of us. Yeah, we, we trained um, quite a bit with Kristen Neff, who, who here is sort of, yes, you know her. She's yes, yeah. self-compassion guru. And, and so one of the things that we really learned from her and found is 
that when we are beating ourselves up, which, you know, as anxiety sisters, we definitely tend to do, um, we go into fight or flight because it's it, if someone yells at you, you know, you, you go into fight, flight or freeze. Um, and so when we are yelling at ourselves in our head, what's happening? We're making ourselves more anxious. So it's this real rethinking of how we speak to ourselves in our head. And um, like you would a very dear friend going through anxiety or going through something difficult, which is like, I, I know that this is a real struggle. I know this is really hard, you know, and, and like all people, sometimes we struggle. There's like a common humanity here and you're going to be okay. You know, you're going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. This too shall pass. Whatever, whatever you speak about in a very calm voice that will soothe you at the time. And here's a trick coming from a communication professor. There's a lot of research that shows that the most important voice that your own ears can hear is your own. So if you just say those things out loud, you will bring yourself right out of fight or flight. So we are huge fans of talking to yourself out loud. We don't care how you look. Just do it. <laughs> and you can whisper if you're really that, that concerned. But I mean, I do. I talk to myself all the time. I'm, I say, you know, okay, my anxiety is here, but it's not driving. Mm -hmm. I can handle this. I will get through this. I've gotten through this before, and I will get through this again. And it's my own voice reassuring my, my brain. And it just is amazing how that really stops all the spinning. And since I grew up in New York City until a, and I lived there until a few years ago, everyone on the street is talking to themselves. So it's very easy. <laughs> <laughs> and now that we're wearing masks all the time, no one can tell yeah, if you're talking yeah. to yourself. Right. Good. Good. Yeah. Talking to ourselves out loud. That's a really good one to try. People haven't tried that. I've definitely done that myself and, and done sort of said things to myself in the mirror from time to time yes. to sure. looking into my own eyes. That sort of thing can be quite powerful as well. Quite quite confronting but but powerful awesome. and I also really like that idea I think number two about accepting you know oh, yeah. this, I've heard it called before the acceptance paradox because we think if we accept something about ourselves whether it's anxiety or anything really that somehow it's going to take over and then we're saying it's okay for it to be there but actually the opposite happens when we accept something it's like the resistance disappears and and the the problem can start to dissolve more easily right. than than us right. fighting against it. So such a powerful reminder. Um, yeah, so thank you for for, for sharing that. Um, I suppose one, one other question is, you, you mentioned kind of medication a couple of times about um, how it's a useful tool. Um, what's your stance on that? Because I think there's so much taboo mm. still, even though so many people take medication for anxiety, it's so common. Yeah. And yet I hear from people saying, I you know, I didn't want to take it. I delayed. I didn't want to talk to my doctor. Um, I want to come. I wanted to come off it. But can you share your your perspectives on that? Well, I think our perspective is first of all, like anything else, anything that helps <laughs> that doesn't hurt anyone else. We believe in. Um, but second of all, you know, we've seen ourselves that there are times where someone's in particularly in crisis, right, in, a, in, in crisis with their anxiety, where it's really ruling where they, where they can go, what they can do, who they can see. Um, they're really sort of not able to take any of the other steps to help themselves where medication might be what they need. It might be, so like Abby was saying, if you're in a fetal position, someone can say, you know, go for a walk or even talk to yourself. And, and, you know, all of those things are not very helpful in that situation because you can't, you're just totally in fight, flight, or freeze. You can't get out of fight, flight, or freeze. So in the, in that case, I have to say that someone may need to go on medication either for a short time or for the long term. but we're both on medication. We, we see it as part of our treatment plan um, because it allows us to do all the things that we do to take care of ourselves, to take care of our mental health. And so it's a good investment for us. You know, it, it's something that doesn't change your personality or doesn't make everything okay, but it just allows you to be taken care of yourself some of the time. And that said, that's our experience. And we know from our sisterhood, our community, that 
um, that medicine is not for everybody. Yeah. There are definitely, you know, people call them side effects. We call them front and center because some of them are doozies and they may be deal breakers. And we have gotten very lucky in that we res- both of us respond well to our SSRI. Our, I take Prozac, she takes so Zoloft, right? So, you know, we responded very well to the, those drugs, but there are lots of people who don't. And so like anything else, it's not that we're pro pharma, we're anti suffering from anxiety. We want people to live the biggest life they can. And if your world is being shrunk by your anxiety because your anxiety is in charge and medication can help you get out of that, even if you can just use it temporarily to get to a place where you can then start getting out in nature and meditating and going to acupuncture or doing any of the things that help or changing your diet, whatever it might be, then that's a worthy investment, but it isn't for everyone. And we do believe that everyone should research the medications before they take anything. We have a a checklist in our book called Questions for Your Prescriber that we believe that anyone who's considering medication, they should take that checklist to their doctor and get answers to every question on it. Right, because a lot of people are taking medication. They don't know sort of what kind of medication they're taking. They don't know what exactly it's supposed to be doing. So, or even how it works. Or how, so we have really specific questions, and you need to find a provider that will answer those questions for you. Mm, yeah, that's a really well-rounded way of, way of talking about it. I, hope, I think that's going to be helpful for people to hear. So that's great. Um, what, what are some of the common questions that you hear in your community? Because you, you mentioned you've got this massive community. Is it 200,000? Yeah. amazing and um, growing every week <laughs> yeah brilliant yeah, that's, that's a wonderful that's a wonderful question because i think all over the world people have similar questions and in terms of our community which is which is pretty interesting and so you know one of the one of the things is you know could this symptom really be connected to anxiety um, because, you know, people sometimes they get a rash or they have those cardiac symptoms or stomach symptoms, but they also may find themselves burping a lot or farting a lot or um, coughing, coughing, peeing or a lot, peeing, you know, all these, all these weird symptoms with happen with anxiety. Right. And so people say, yeah. like, is this really connected to my anxiety? Could this be? And the answer is just always yes, it could be. It always, you know, anxiety can just do about anything. Yeah, your anything body. your body can do, any sound it can make, fluid it can produce, smell, anything can be a result of anxiety. And then I think that um, our most common, our most common uh, comment about is, is usually like what you were saying before was, um, you know, you were talking about like that that feeling of dissociation or depersonalization, how, how scary it is. Well, so many people, something like that, so many people will say, I've had that my whole life. I've never told anybody because I thought it meant I was crazy. I didn't know other people felt this way. And we get that about so many different areas of anxiety. I didn't know that this wasn't just a weird me thing. And that is so relieving, right? Because it's like, I... I am not crazy. I am not like this person walking around with these things that other people just would never understand. No, we're not people, alone. We're not, I'm not alone. I'm not, you know, we say you're unique, but your anxiety's not. Um, and, and that, you know, so then you know other people understand you and you know that there are things you can do to help. And that, that's sort of the most common piece of our community. Mm, yeah, yeah yeah and it's so interesting isn't it the the weird ways that anxiety can manifest itself oh my gosh weird symptoms weird like aches and pains or tingling oh, yeah. or right. all these different right. things that yeah oh, unless you know no, that could be a symptom of anxiety oh it's then. just yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 no it, it will do anything it can do to catch our attention you know right. whether that's your ocd whether that's your panic whether that's your generalized anxiety disorder it will scream loud until you pay attention yeah yeah that's interesting so yeah i often often talk to people about how anxiety is trying to get our attention to get us to to um take care of ourselves or maybe get us to change something in our lives or you know to to pay attention exactly as you say and 
and yeah. and sort of tuning into ourselves and listening to ourselves and learning about ourselves you know it's gonna it's gonna help us to so that the anxiety maybe doesn't have to to shout quite so loudly right uh, right and it, really, it, it makes so much sense from more of an evolutionary perspective because you know when we were living in constant danger right and you know so, say you were eating berries off a bush and there was a woolly mammoth around the corner you know ready to come around and take a bite out of you you couldn't get lost in eating those berries you know your your senses had to stay heightened in order to stay alive and so you know your body will do anything to make you wake up and and you know that has stayed with us is that our body wants us to wake up do woolly mammoths bite i don't know i think they, they trample for dinner. <laughs> they trample i don't know I haven't seen one in a long time. I mean, we were alive. That part caught me. Wait a minute. We were Sounds alive. terrifying, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. That's been so, so helpful. Thank you so much for everything you shared. Um, where can people find out more about you and what you're up to and that sort of thing? You can find us uh, at anxietysisters.com. You can join our community. It is always free and welcoming. We call ourselves the Anxiety Sisters, but we really mean anyone of any gender with any amount of anxiety and you qualify. Uh, we have a representation by um, people from over 200 countries and territories around the world of all different types. So it's a very inclusive community, but just anxiety community wasn't that catchy. We thought Anxiety Sisters was a little <laughs> friendlier. Um, uh, we have a monthly podcast, The Spin Cycle with the Anxiety Sisters. And you can find that anywhere you get your podcasts. We also have written a book, The Anxiety Sisters Survival Guide. In the UK, it is published by John Murray Press. And in the United States, it is published by Random House. Um, and in the UK, you can go, um, you can get it on, of course, on Amazon, but you can also go into a local bookstore. Yes. And they can order it for you if they don't have it. Because a friend of mine just did that <laughs> in, in, right. in England just very, very a few days ago. So. And, and also come to our Facebook page. It is the most welcoming, warm, generous, fun place to be. We do really cool stuff on there. Um, in fact, tonight we're doing a book club. <laughs> on a awesome. Facebook Live book club. So uh, we, do, we do all kinds of good stuff. It, it's always free and welcoming. And we really... Mags and I are on there every single day responding to as many comments as we possibly can and you can also email us at abs and mags at anxietysisters.com and we promise we respond to every email we get wonderful <laughs> wonderful it takes us a few days yeah, it sometimes takes, these days it takes a few days but, Fair but enough. <laughs> absolutely get back to you I promise brilliant thank you so much I feel very reassured talking to you both and um, I think oh, what you're doing is amazing you. so yeah, that's the highest well done compliment. On, thank you. Well done on everything you're doing, and thank you for spreading such a, a wonderful message. Thank yeah. you so much for having us. We yeah. really appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>